Did you know that in the Bible, there are people who claim to have seen God? Were they dreaming? Were they high on desert drugs? Were they making the whole thing up? And, and doesn't Judaism teach that God is invisible, meaning he doesn't have a body or anything like that? So how can a human being see God? I think I have the answer. Statue of Liberty is something we can see. It sends out a powerful message. So it's not surprising that in some religions, people want to make a visible image of their God. But can anyone really see God? I don't mean some hallucination or the product of someone's vivid imagination. Can we actually see the Creator? Well, do you remember the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments in the Bible? According to the Torah, when God spoke to us on Mount Sinai, the, the whole mount was on fire. It was covered in a dark cloud. It was shaking violently. It must have been quite a scene. And the entire nation, meaning all of our Israelite forefathers, heard God speaking audibly, but they didn't see Him. They heard God's voice, and it terrified them, but they saw no image or form. Years later, Moses hammered this point home. You saw no form. Consequently, it would be very wrong, dead wrong, to make any kind of idol representing God in human or animal form. The pagan nations worshiped their gods in the form of wood and silver and gold statues, but this was not for the people of Israel. Our God was not to be reduced to an idol. Let's get started with this general question. Is it possible for a human being to actually see God? Well, I'm really not sure, to be honest. Based on what I'm reading, I would say yes. We see God every day in each other. You can become enlightened. You may see him or you may have a feel of him. We see the flowers. We feel the, we feel the wind. We see the trees. It's God. I've been to India every year for the last 15 years. And I think I've finally gotten used to all these Indian idols, the, the many different representations of all the gods of Hinduism, or the way some Hindus would explain it, all these different gods, the hundreds of them, represent different faces of, of the same single force, the universal God. I'll tell you, these Hindu idols are everywhere, and they come in all shapes and sizes. There is Matsya, part fish and part human, with four arms. There is Narashimha, part lion and part human, and you guessed it, with four arms too. There is Ganesh. By the way, all of these are called Lord by Hindu, so Lord Ganesh, the elephant god. Part elephant, part human, with those four arms again. And then there's Hanuman, the very popular monkey god, who according to one description is one of the most important deities in popular Hindu piety, even though he does not have an exalted place in the pantheon. Hanuman is enormously strong, has magic powers, and is a skilled healer, but his greatest quality is said to be his devotion to Rama. His status as Rama's servant and devotee is also said to make him more receptive and attentive to human requests. In short, he's a deity who gets things done. As expected, Hanuman is a monkey-faced man with <laughs> just two arms, although I've seen pictures of him with ten arms. Now, the thing that's so fascinating to me is that our forefathers, the Israelites, lived in the midst of an idol-worshipping culture. In fact, the Egyptians were the most sophisticated idol-worshippers of the day, and our people lived among them for several hundred years before the Exodus. And yet our God would never allow himself to be worshipped in the form of any kind of image or idol. He wasn't like Baal of the Canaanites, known as a storm god. He wasn't like Osiris of the Egyptians, known as the Lord of the dead. Yahweh, our God, was utterly transcendent, and he could not be compared to any god or any idol. Is it wrong for people to make earthly images of God? Any kind of imagery of God is a false idol. So kind of praying or worshiping to any kind of inanimate object is a sin. You may worship images, you, can, you may make images, it hardly makes a difference. The faith is what matters. I don't think you should do it, because it, for respect for other people. Let me repeat to you what Moses said to our Israelite forefathers more than 3,000 years ago. When God spoke on Mount Sinai and gave us the Ten Commandments, you saw no form, and therefore it would be wrong to make any kind of form or idol that supposedly represented the Lord. 
This is actually a foundational teaching of Judaism. So if you go into a synagogue or temple, you might find some stained glass windows. You certainly see Hebrew words, but you won't find any form or image. That's in stark contrast, say, with a Hindu temple that's literally bursting with idols and images. Now, as the centuries went on, Jewish thinkers began to develop the concept of God's complete incorporeality, meaning that he had no material substance of any kind. This is perhaps articulated most clearly by Moses Maimonides, who was the most famous of the medieval rabbis. According to Maimonides, God lacked any type of physical substance, and this is what he said about the one true God. He is not a body and has no strength in the body, and has no shape or image or relationship to a body or parts thereof. He does not partake of any physical actions or qualities, and if he were to be a body, then he'd be like any other body and would not be God. So how do we explain the passages in the Bible that speaks about God's hand or ear or arm? Well, according to Maimonides, these were all anthropomorphic. In other words, the Bible was speaking about God in human language. But the reason that the Israelites didn't see any form on Mount Sinai is because God has, quote, no body nor power of body. The question is then in the Bible, when it says people saw God, what actually happened? Coming up next, I know him personally. That is the only place where there is true rest. Everybody might have his or her experience uh, with God one way or the other, but not in a sense that uh, he or she knows God personally. So can a human being really see God? If so, what does he look like? What about the Jewish teaching that God has no material form or substance? Well, actually, there are a number of places in the Bible where it's recorded that people literally saw God. One of them is in the Torah where it says that Moses, along with some other leaders and the 70 elders of Israel, went up Mount Sinai and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. The prophet Ezekiel's vision is famous. He described a majestic scene with flaming chariots and multi-headed angelic beings. And above it all was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man, which Ezekiel then attempted to describe. Other prophets had similar experiences, speaking of being completely undone because my eyes have seen the king. You might say, well, maybe they just saw visions of the Lord, not the Lord himself. The problem is that some of the texts actually speak of people seeing God, not just a vision of the Lord. And the account that we read earlier goes on to say that God didn't strike those elders who saw him, which would have been expected since no one can see God and live. The fact is there's a paradox in our Jewish scriptures. On the one hand, it's just plainly that no one can see God and live, meaning see his, his face, his full essence and glory. And yet in other places, it does say that he was seen. And while we know that God doesn't have a material form, it seems perfectly clear that he has a spiritual form. So we asked if we can see God. Here's another question. Can people really know God personally? Yeah, oh, yes they can because I know him personally. I know him personally. That is the only place where there is true rest and peace and joy. Um, yeah. I think they can. No, I don't think so. God is God. Of course you can get known personally. Everybody might have his or her experience uh, with God one way or the other, but not in a sense that uh, he or she knows God personally. Let's step back and ask a more basic question. If you believe the Bible is God's word, as I believe it is, then what does that imply? It implies that God wants to communicate with us. But why does he want to communicate with us? Just to give us information or rules and regulations? No, he communicates with us because he wants to have relationship with us. And he tells us things about himself, about his character and nature, so that we can know him, not just know about him. But that comes back to our paradox then. How can the invisible, eternal, perfect God have a relationship with earthly, frail, sinful, imperfect human beings? Theologians talk about transcendence and imminence, but what they really mean is this. How can the untouchable be touched? And if, if God is so infinitely other than us, if, if he's actually unknowable, then, then how can we know him? 
Actually, the answers are found in the pages of our sacred scriptures. Do you recall what happened after our people were redeemed from slavery? God instructed Moses to have our people build a special tent from Calder Tabernacle so that he could dwell among us. That's right, God actually wanted to dwell in our midst. He wanted to be near us, in close relationship with us, literally tabernacling among us. But he seemed so uncontainable. The ancient rabbis addressed this issue too, and they said that Moses himself was even baffled by it. How could a tabernacle with walls and curtains contain the presence of the Almighty? The master of the universe himself explained, the entire world cannot contain my glory. Yet when I wish, I can concentrate my entire essence into one small spot. Indeed, I am most high, yet I sit in a limited, constricted refuge in the shadow of the tabernacle. That, my friends, is a revelation. The entire world cannot contain my glory, yet when I wish I can concentrate my essence into one small spot? That means that the infinite one can reveal himself in a finite way. It means that the untouchable one can be touched. It means that the invisible God can make himself visible. Do you believe that God exists? Yes. Both believe it? Okay. Why do you think he's real? I mean, can, can you see him the way you see me? No. No. Not All in right. a physical aspect, no. All right, so no physical aspect. So have you ever heard him talk to you audibly the same way I talk to you? I haven't, no. Uh, I, mean, I haven't either. Yeah, I wouldn't say audibly in that sense yet. All right. What about like physically touching in that sense? Nope. Not a sense like my dad hugging me, like no. Okay, <laughs> but you're, you're sure God exists? Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so would you say he's he's invisible in terms of to the physical eye? To the physical eye, but he's made himself in, known yeah. through creation and through his word. Okay, invisible so, yet clearly seen. Mm -hmm. So he's invisible and yet he's clearly seen. I like that, that's very profound. <laughs> he's invisible, can't touch him, feel him naturally, hear him audibly but you're sure he's real so how does he make himself known <laughs> uh well he's made himself known i'd say in his word uh when you say his word what do you mean hindu scriptures the uh, quran no I, I wouldn't say that uh that would be his word uh, okay so the bible I, I believe yeah very specifically would be the the holy bible so so through the scriptures god makes himself known to us it's one so, of the ways yeah okay so you don't think that this is just random happening Absolutely not, no. So wh what? a far stretch. Well, the beauty of the word is that the word became flesh, dwelt among us, who could be seen and tasted and touched, felt, talked to, felt you know, physically by, uh, and that's Christ, obviously. But Christ isn't physically here today, yet his spirit lives within us. And he says, okay, well, you know, you don't know where the wind blows from the east, west, south. You don't know where it is, but you know where it's coming, where it's going. You've seen the effects of it, and today his spirit dwells within us. And so there is a sense in which you feel uh, but it's not like the day with, you know, when Christ was walking the earth where, man, when Jesus touched you, you okay. were touched by the hands of God. You know, when I talk to people on the street, I have no idea who they are, what their background is. We don't screen them first. We just ask if they're willing to chat a little bit. So it's always fascinating to find out their perspective. These two folks came up from Dallas, Texas. They're only in New York for the second time. But when I asked them if they believe that God exists, they had no doubt about it. But hang on. They, they said you can't see him physically. You can't touch him physically, you know, the, the way you, you hug someone. You don't hear his voice audibly, but they had absolutely no question whatsoever that God existed. And one of the things that made them so sure was creation. You know, the simple saying, a watch implies a watchmaker. I was once talking to a waiter in a Chinese restaurant who was an atheist, started arguing with me. I said, this food just appeared out of nowhere. This dish appeared out of nowhere. He said, what are you talking about? He said, they made it in the kitchen. I said, exactly. A universe implies that somebody made it. A human being implies that we were fashioned and created. For them, they had no doubt whatsoever that the invisible God made us to reflect who he is. Still to come. I guess he thought he was God. Either he was lying or insane, one of those two. Is it possible or allowable to capture God in any kind of man-made image? Can the invisible God be seen? Can the untouchable God be touched? We know that the Bible condemns all forms of idolatry, but it also tells us that God can be touched. But how? 
we're about to solve a mystery. Now, it's true that our scriptures teach that no one can see God's face and live. In the same way, you can't stare endlessly at the sun without going blind. And actually, when you look at the sun, you don't see the sun itself, but more the rays that emanate from it. Well, could it be the same with the Lord? We can't see him in his unveiled majesty and glory, but maybe we can see his reflection. Or to put this in solar terms, maybe we can see the rays that emanate from him. And, and could it be like the sun that he's seen and unseen at the same time? If, if I see your face in a mirror, I, I've seen you, I know what you look like, but I haven't seen you directly. It's the same with the Lord. We can get a glimpse of his character and majesty and beauty without seeing him directly. And, and because God is, is so far beyond us, because his unity is, is so complex, that he can fill the heavens and be right with us at the same time, far and near, invisible, Invisible, untouchable, and touchable, filling the heavens and yet dwelling in the tabernacle. That's our God. And that leads to the biggest question of all. If God, who fills the universe, could literally pitch his tent and tabernacle among us for a period of time, is it possible that he could fill the universe and appear in human form if he wanted to? Yes, it's true. Our Holy Torah tells us the same scriptures that say we can't see God and live and say that God is not a man also tell us that at times he appeared in human form. Do you want to hear more? So, so let me ask you this. If someone looked at Jesus, could, were they really looking at God? I mean, doesn't the Bible say nobody can see God's face and live? So if, if they looked at Jesus, did they literally see God's face or is it different? I think they saw God's face. Um, Christ, being cloaked in humanity, made it possible to look God in the face and not die. Okay, so let me make sure I understand. God in his complete essence, if, if we saw him fully as he is in all his glory, what would happen to us? We would die. We, couldn't, we could not handle glory like that. Okay, it's too intense, too hot, too, too everything. But you're saying we can look at Jesus and in a sense see God's face, but he's, he's clothed in human form. He's the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. Well, what's the difference between saying that Jesus is the image of God and some Hindu saying, oh, Sai Baba, that's, that's God incarnate. Isn't it? Or Zeus came down, one of the gods came among us. What's the difference here? I'd say the gods of the nations have to be served. Our God serves. The gods of the nations have to be carried and our God carries us. And I would say to any of them that say, man, this is God incarnate. I would want to put it up to and say, let's put him up to Christ, who we believe is God incarnate, and you'll see, notice just oceans of difference between the two. Uh, whereas one, I mean, we've sat in Hindu temples and watched them bathing a God. They have to wake him up, they have to clean him, they have to clothe him. And I'm going, man, isn't it great to know I can wake up each morning knowing full well that Christ, who is in his sovereignty, is able to clothe me and care for me, yeah. that I don't have to kind of feed him and make sure he's taken care of, that he takes care of me, so carries no comparison. me. So. There's no comparison. <laughs> Do you remember what some of the ancient rabbis said about God? They taught that he had the power to concentrate his entire essence into one small spot if he chose to do so, while remaining the transcendent God who filled the universe. Sometimes he did this in a fire, like when he appeared to Moses in a burning bush. Sometimes he did this in a cloud, like the one that occasionally filled the tabernacle. But that doesn't mean that God was a fire or a cloud. Of course not. In the same way, sometimes God chose to concentrate his essence into a human body, like the time when he appeared to Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 18, conversing with them, revealing his plan to them. That doesn't mean that God was human. Of course not. And it doesn't mean that Abraham actually saw the form of the Lord that day. No, not at all. Instead, when God chose to pitch his tent among us for a little while, I mean a fleshly human tent, Abraham saw the tent and had a close encounter with God himself. But here's the most amazing, wonderful, profound truth of all. God so wanted to make himself known to us that he chose to pitch his tent among us, I mean a human tent, in a more lasting way for 33 years. And he gave this human tent a name, Jesus, the Son of God. He pitched his tent among us while remaining the transcendent God who fills the universe. And that's how this Jesus is the one in whom all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. He's the one who said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. 
What do you think he meant? He's saying, if you see me, you see God, because I have the direct connection to him. If you've seen me, I guess he thought he was God. That's what he thought. Um, either he was lying or insane, one of those two, or something like that. Jesus was how God showed himself on the earth, so actually he was God in some way. So you could see God in everything. So if Jesus said that, so he was also uh, the son of the God. There are many Jews who are offended when we say that Jesus is divine, as if we were making God into a man or a man into God. And many times I've been accused of idolatry, and I understand why. But the fact is this concept of God's fullness dwelling in a person is in keeping with what's written in our Hebrew scriptures. And it's also in keeping with God's desire to make himself known to us to participate in our world, to, to give us a first-hand glimpse of who he is without for a moment allowing us to see his actual essence, which no one can see. You might say that, doesn't that mean you're worshiping two gods? <laughs> Not a chance. Instead, I'm just agreeing with what's written in the Torah, that God is complex in his oneness, and, and that he can dwell with us and at the same time be separated from us, that he can be seen and yet unseen, and that's exactly what the New Testament writers said. One of them explained, no one has ever seen God. But the only son who's at the father's side, he's made him known. Another wrote that Jesus, the son of God, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Oh, for sure, this is a mystery. But whoever said that we could figure out God the way we figure out a mathematical equation? Who said that we could comprehend God with our finite minds? That's why God brought it down to earth for us, pitching his tent among us in the person of Jesus, Yeshua, our savior and redeemer. When we've seen him, we've seen God. If you've never followed Jesus' life or read his words, get hold of a New Testament, start reading today. You'll be amazed at what you find. In fact, you'll find God.